Good afternoon, everyone. Just going to give folks a couple moments to uh, get into the room before we get started. We'll, we'll get started in a minute or two. Thank you so much for being here today. Sorry about that. All right, I do wanna make sure that we have the full 59 minutes to get um, through this topic because it is a very popular topic. Um, first of all, my name is Maria Jose Araya. I am the Learner Engagement Manager at the AAMC and I'm extremely excited to have our guests with us today. This is actually a follow-up to one of our spring sessions about medical school, medical school interviews. Um, so we're, we're just so grateful that you're here with us today. Um, and to introduce our panelists, we have Mrs. Jennifer Kimball from the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. And we also have Dr. Lena Mehta from, sorry, from Case Western. Oh no, is that wrong? I'm so sorry. Yes, Case Western. I'm like, I didn't see it. Thank you. I thought my notes were wrong. Apologize. So we're going to get started. I'm going to do a couple housekeeping things very, very briefly. The first thing is, is for all for all attendees, you are, your videos are automatically off and so is your sound. You should only be able to hear the panelists. It is being recorded, so you will be able to come back to this uh, 30 days after the event, or 30 days after the event. Uh, the third thing is, is if you do wanna ask someone on the panel a question, please make sure to do that in the Q&A section um, and also, uh, send us any messages if you're having some technical difficulties. So I do see that we are at 400 already. So we wanna go ahead and get started. So again, Dr. Meta and Mrs. Kimball, let's go ahead and get moving with our live mock interviews. Thank you, Maria. Jen, you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. I'm going to be the interviewer. Jen is going to be the interviewee. So we're going to debrief at the end. So hello, Jen. How are you? I'm Dr. Lena Meta. Hi. So Jen, tell me about yourself. Um, so let's see. I was born in Hawaii and um, I lived there until we were about two. And then we moved to the mainland and um, lived in Oklahoma for a while. And uh, after Oklahoma, we moved to Alabama and um, lived there for a little while, but then we moved to Germany and I grew up in Germany and um, then I came back to America and um, I went to high school in um, Alabama and then I went to college in Alabama and um, I studied biology um, and I did research in Dr. Smith's research lab. And um, I volunteered at the hospital and I was a resident assistant in my resident hall. Um, and now I'm applying to med school. Oh, it's quite a story, thank you. Um, okay, so Jen, tell me why did you decide to choose medicine over other fields that help and serve people? Um, well, I've always wanted to be a doctor. I, I remember when I was in the seventh grade, we had to do a, 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 a presentation to our classmates on a career. And I picked medicine because I really liked science and I, I really wanted to help people and make a difference. And so um, I did uh, my project on, you know, uh, what are things that doctors do? And it just really appealed to me because um, I'm, I'm a leader at my school. I've been involved in a lot of organizations and I, I look forward to, to being a leader in, in medicine. Hmm. Okay. Other PAs, nurses, do those do the same? Do they do the same things? Um, to, to a less, I mean, I, as a nurse, you, you would probably lead other nurses, but, um, the doctor is the one that really, um, like puts the, the orders together and um, has the medical team that 
uh, executes that. Um, I, I did some research in college and I really like the idea of doing research. And so I know that sometimes doctors do research and I think that might be interesting to also do as a doctor. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Jen, tell me about something that has really ignited your curiosity. Um, probably cancer research. Um, I, I read a book about, um, actually, I read a book uh, called When the Air Hits Your, Your Brain, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, so that got me interested in um, medicine even more. Um, I watched a couple of documentaries on um, medicine and, and being a doctor. And I think that really has, has been very interesting for me is to, to do that. Um, my, my aunt had breast cancer and um, when she was diagnosed, um, my, my mom asked me, cause she knew I was pre-med, you know, she asked me uh, what are some uh, like, what, what are some different kinds of, of breast cancer? And so I, I looked up some of the stuff that, um, you know, some treatment plans that people with breast cancer have. So I think cancer is also something in medicine that makes me very curious. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about a stressful situation that you found yourself in and how you managed it? Um, probably spring of my junior year was really stressful. Um, I was studying for the MCAT and I was, um, I was an RA in, in the residence halls and um, I was dealing with some family stuff and just that semester was just a really stressful full time in my, my life. It, um, I started to feel kind of depressed about things and I just, I just didn't, I didn't know what was next um, with everything. So I think that was probably a very stressful time. In, in my life. And I had to handle it. I mean, I, I did pretty well in the MCAT. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of that MCAT score. I think it's um, a good score to, to make with everything that I had going on. How did you handle all the other things? Um, well, I, uh, I talked to my student health services office and um, made an appointment with them. My, uh, my hall director in, in my dorm told me I needed to go and talk with somebody. And I did, and I, I don't know if it was much help, but um, I did really well in my grades that semester. Um, I got great letters of recommendation, I hope. Um, and I did very well on the MCAT in spite of everything. Okay, you did well on the MCAT, okay. Jen, tell me about an area of weakness that you feel like you need to overcome on your path to becoming a physician. Um, that's, that's, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I probably, um, uh, I tend to be a perfectionist and I, I want things to work out really well. Um, so sometimes I, I put a lot of energy forward and on a project because I, I really want it to succeed. Um, so that's probably an area of weakness for me. It's just, I, I work, I get too committed to something. So it's hard for me sometimes to just take a step back and go, this is, this is good. I, I did a good job on that. So I guess being a perfectionist. Okay. So Jen, is there anything or any message you would like me to take to the admissions committee on your behalf? that I really wanna to go to school here. Um, it's been a dream of mine. Um, I love I love Case Western. Um, I've been to Cleveland several times. Um, I have an aunt that lives in Akron, so it's not that far, um, but I, I really wanna be a doctor. And I think, I think Case Western is gonna be a great fit for me. Um, I really like your new facilities um, and everybody here just seems really nice. So I think, I think I'm, I'm willing to work really hard at Case Western. Um, and I, I really think that this is gonna be the right fit for me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So um, interestingly enough, we have 
been told that, uh, are we doing this based on a live interview that either of you have performed? So I have a feeling we have some head nods that yes, these are some of the things that you witnessed, which is exactly why we're doing this session today, just so that we we give uh, applicants information that will be helpful to them in their interview. So the first thing we're going to move into, and, and thank you both, that was fantastic. Um, here we go. One second. I'm so sorry. All right. All right. So, uh, <laughs> Dr. Mehta, could you please provide some interview feedback based on this current interview, since that's just what we just watched? Absolutely. I'm going to give feedback to Jen and I'm going to give feedback to myself. So I also highlighted what I think are some bad habits for interviewers or things that you can watch as an applicant. So for me, the question I hate above all other questions is tell me about yourself. For me, that is the mark of an unskilled interviewer who may not have been necessarily prepped or sort of a process lacking in discipline. That said, however, you may get that. And so what Jen did was start at the very bold, Jen, do you want to critique your response? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Mehta and I were texting back and forth before this session, and we're talking about some of the, the questions that we get that we wish that we could poke the students say, no, say this instead, say that instead. But as interviewers, that's not our responsibility. That's the student's responsibility to kind of shape that. So um, tell me about yourself. We started kind of way too early, in my opinion, unless it was relevant to kind of where I am now at this point. Um, so I think being very succinct, because like Dr. Meta said, sometimes interviewers will start this off when they just don't know what direction to take the interview. And so it's a kind of a nice neutral question to kind of ease into the interview in, in their mind. Um, so tell me about yourself. You might just want to kind of hit, hit some highlights. You know, I'm a first generation college student um, for me in my, my real world. Um, I taught seventh grade social studies before I went back to graduate school. Um, I am first generation college student. And then, um, you know, something else might be some of the hobbies I do. You know, I really enjoy um, hiking and, uh, you know, photography or something. And so that allows Dr. Meta then to build on the next question like, oh, photography, how did you get interested in that? So, so it becomes conversational. The other thing I did was clearly lost interest. So one thing you can do is watch your interviewer and see if what you're saying resonates. I was looking around and fiddling, which could happen. The other thing that you could do as an applicant is say, thank you, what, where would you like me to begin? Is there anything specific? You can even ask for a little bit of guidance as to where they want you to go with the tell me everything. But watching your interviewer for their response is a conversation. Like you would have a conversation with somebody else. You're watching what their feedback is and that's how you can also tailor your response. The other thing that Jen Alas did was present a somewhat disorganized thought process with the lots of ands and ums and pauses and delays and meandering. Would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. And I intentionally did that just because I really want you to recognize that the interview means that you've made it through several cuts at that school. And so don't feel like they're giving you an interview offer out of pity. They're not. Um, we have thousands of folks that won't make it to the interview at Vanderbilt. And so go in there confident in knowing your application very well and having a direction. Like, what do you want the school to get from your in per well, now it's virtual, but your, your interview day at that institution. So having an idea of where you want to go with the interview is very important. The other thing too is societally in our American society, we are not acclimated to speaking about ourselves in such a targeted and long-term way. So I always say practice being interviewed, don't memorize your answer. Have people ask you questions. I think that's being medically related. What's your favorite movie? What's your early childhood memory? So that you can get used to thinking on your feet and speaking more succinctly and watching that other person for their response again, if you should go on. I think also if they ask you a question that you're like, wow, I have so many different thoughts I need to figure out how I want to convey this. It's totally fine to say, um, that's a great question. Let me just think about that for one second, because you let the interviewer know I've got a lot of things to say, but I don't want to waste your time by going on and on and kind of having this word salad of, of ideas about this, this question. The other thing is check your career center at your colleges, because a lot of times they'll have interview software. And yeah, it's kind of designed for people to 
maybe practice like job interview questions, but the thinking on your feet piece of it is, is very helpful. I agree with everything that Ms. Kimball just said and be careful saying that's a great question too many times, however, a couple times strategically, but I have had applicants who have said that prior to every single question that I asked them during the interview. So it was clearly a not so skillful stall tactic. Yeah. I wholeheartedly apologize for the screen flickering no, on good. stop. Okay. Uh, Fine. So um, I know that uh, it, this was a very different process for you, uh, Mrs. Kimball, to, to participate in this regard. Um, and we do have a couple questions that we're going to get into about the trickier questions you may be asked or things you want to do at your interview. But I would also want to ask, could you both speak briefly about the physical appearance for an applicant, for an interviewee, please? Whether it's a uh, type of dress, how formal, how not formal, um, if they should show tattoos, uh, should they have um, colored hair, et cetera. If there's any thoughts that you'd love to share on that, we'd really appreciate it. Um, for us, I mean, nowadays with virtual interviews, we're only kind of seeing the shoulders up um, with that. So we uh, will email all of our interview or candidates that are asked to interview, kind of like a tip sheet. And one of those on there, you know, just dress appropriately. Um, and if you don't have, you know, a, a jacket or a sweater to put on, feel free to borrow roommates or something like that. Like just, you know, this is not a, a fashion show, but it helps the candidate feel more professional, if you will, when they are, are dressed a little bit nicer than they would normally. Um, we haven't really had an issue with candidates dressing inappropriately on the interview. And I don't know if it's because we have a tip sheet or, or what. Um, in regards to tattoos, to be honest with you, we really don't see them just because we're doing head and shoulders nowadays. Um, but I know a lot of our students have tattoos uh, when they get to medical school, but we don't have an issue with that. I echo that. Every office has different views on every office is staffed by human beings who all expect different things. I would err towards the median and wear that conservative dark suit that everybody else is. I know my admissions committee were not bothered by piercings and colored hair and tattoos, but I can't say that for other admissions committees. Right. So I would just stay towards the norm and just kind of stay in the middle because you just don't know who your audience is going to be. And that's part of the professional identity. When you have patients and that applicant saying to me, well, that's not fair. I want to be who I am. But Professional identity formation is you being cognizant of your audience and understanding what a patient may need to see from you, understand how you may need to present yourself for that situation. Those are all great, great uh, pieces of advice and very essential in regards to this process, especially like you said, that it, most of it is a virtual process now. So you don't get to see the, the whole person. Um, so it's important that you with the, the small space that you have that you maximize on that impact. And let me just build on that in a really sure. grouchy way. I'm a practicing physician and I'm a mom. And so neck tattoos, face tattoos, I would say no. There are hospitals, some hospitals that still have um, requirements that you can't have visible tattoos. So at some places you may see healthcare workers with bandages around or long white sleeves on because they're not allowed to show tattoos. So if you're gonna get one, be mindful of what your professional identity may look like and what your requirements may be in the workforce. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I am gonna pivot backwards a moment because I skipped over the both of you being able to do your own intros. So we're gonna go back to those slides and then we're gonna go into the getting deeper section. So give me a moment. All right, there we go. So uh, Jen, if you could start with us. Sure. So I'm the director of admissions at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine located in Nashville, Tennessee. I provided you what kind of a brief outline of what our two interviews are for the MD or the MD PhD candidate. Um, so we will have you for basically five hours. Um, your interview is just a portion of the day, um, but it's also our opportunity to tell you more about Vanderbilt. And so uh, we'll have one open file interview that will last around 40 minutes. 
and a 20 minute close file interview. And I do want to take a pause just right now, since we're talking about kind of the generalities of interview. A lot of schools have an open and closed file interview. Uh, for an open file, it means the interviewer has had access to your application materials. But I do know that some of the faculty that interview for me um, don't necessarily want to read your file ahead of time because they want it to be more conversational and organic. Okay, so don't read anything. Don't get nervous if they ask you stuff that's blatantly in your file. It's just they elected not to read it beforehand. It's just conversational. The closed file, the interviewer only knows your, your name. So those are going to be more um, kind of a set list of questions that all of our interviewees are asked. Uh, we do a conversation about the curriculum because we kind of have a sort of a flipped classroom uh, approach to the interview. So we send you a link that has a bunch of videos for you to watch ahead of time. And then on the interview day, everything's more conversational building on that. Um, and then the concluding remarks is when I tell you about financial aid and missions, uh, I think it's important for you um, to have transparency and what kind of happens next behind the scenes uh, here at Vanderbilt. The MD PhD, it's two days long, which it sounds terrifying. It's not two entire full days because that would be scary. Um, there's lots of breaks involved with that, but that's pretty much how their day runs. Um, and the reason why it lasts longer is because you have those faculty meetings and Sometimes this faculty members on, you know, presenting at a conference won't be back until Friday and things like that nature. But Vanderbilt has embraced the idea of doing virtual interviews. Um, I know Dr. Mehta and I and our, our peers, we talked a lot when we had to pivot to virtual interviews. And um, I think a lot of the schools just really value it. It's a way to provide equity in the admissions process. Um, and then we have lots of opportunities to engage outside the interview, including our optional open houses. Um, and I know a lot of schools are doing open houses for interviewees. Um, we are all very conscious that there could be bias for folks who are able to physically come in and interview, I'm sorry, come into an open house um, because they're, they're there, they, they have the opportunity to learn more about the institution and stuff, but we intentionally do not identify those students who attend one of the optional open houses in our selection process. So our faculty who are involved in the admissions committee are not knowledgeable about who attended an open house. So I feel like I'm getting kind of in the weeds with this. So I wanna uh, step back and uh, hand it off to Dr. Mehta um, to talk a little bit more. Thank you so much. It's great to hear about um what Vanderbilt is doing. So let's move on. Dr. Mehta. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jen. So we have three programs at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. We have the university program, which is our four-year, more traditional, larger MD track. We have our MD-PhD program, just as Vandy does. It's an MSTP. And then we have a five-year program for physician investigators called the Cleveland Clinical Learning College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. So lots of things going on here. So much as uh, Ms. Kimball indicated, we have a flipped classroom model for curriculum. Our day starts out, starts out with just kind of a meet the deans, meet the dream team, which is what I call my admissions and financial aid team. Thing. Uh, we have, so we have curricular breakout rooms in the morning. We have a virtual tour. We have a financial aid session. In the afternoon, there's scheduled breaks. There's scheduled downtime. There are two interviewers. One is with the health education professional. It may be a professor. It may be a researcher, it may be a faculty, it may be somebody who works deeply in med eds. We call that health education professional. That's 45 to 60 minutes in duration. It's partially open, the MCAT score, it, our interviewers are blinded to the MCAT score. Followed then by a medical student interview where the medical student's actually interviewing the applicant for 30 minutes. That has certain areas of the application available, the personal statement and the experiences, everything else is blinded. Our MSTP candidates go through the whole university program interview process as well because their curriculum is part of the UP. And then as Mandy does and all really MD PhD programs do, you have five to six PhD interviews on top of that. Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine has two faculty interviews, each 45 minutes and one medical student interview, 30 minutes in duration. As Ms. Kimball indicated, we also have open houses, but we have those reserved for applicants who are accepted so that we know we don't have the bias. You've already accepted. Come if you want, come if you don't want it. And then once we start to make waitlist acceptances, we open up more open house dates for our applicants to come and visit us. So does that mean that I can't go visit Case Western? Then? I you want to go to one visit. of the open houses. Come on on, Maria, we'll make an exception <laughs> for you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you both. And I, I do apologize that we move right past that, but I love hearing what your programs are doing. 
Um, I do want to specify that the information that the both of you are providing does not pertain to MMI interviews. And the reason we're not um, discussing MMI interviews, it, these are not offered at these institutions. And so we don't want to misinform you on how to act during an MMI or how to approach an MMI, but we are definitely giving general information in regards to talking to an interviewer that you could definitely transfer into any kind of interview. So you've seen the mock interview. Again, thank you, Jen, for playing the student. Um, and now, and you talked to us about the interview feedback. I do have one question because it seems to be popping up over and over as we were talking about the space. Um, Blurred backgrounds, yes, no virtual backgrounds, or would you just prefer to see the background? I think it's up to the applicant. We have trained our interviewers as much as possible, we're all humans, to not let the background influence bias and to not even talk about anything that's in the background. It depends on your technology. My computer doesn't do well with the virtual background, my hair disappears. So it's just <laughs> awkward for everybody. So I just use my regular background, but I leave it to the applicant, really. Jen, do you want to weigh in? Same thing. Um, I use a virtual background just because, um, well, right now I'm in a hotel room on vacation, and I don't think you need to see that. But I will say that um, we have a lot of students that will uh, do the Zoom from like their dorm room or whatever. And just please, if you if you do that and your bed is in the background, please make your bed. Um, I cannot tell you how many times that I've done like, virtual information sessions, different than the interview, um, where we kind of talk about the to perspective students, and I will see unmade beds in the backgrounds of folks. And I'm like, just straighten up back there. That's not a good look, so. Yeah, agree. Be mindful of what your background looks like. We actually provide virtual backgrounds if applicants want to use them. If they don't want to do something on their own, they can pull it from our iApply application portal. But it's really up to the applicant. As I said, hopefully most interviewers have been trained as much as possible to try and eliminate any bias from what your background looks like. We don't offer that service. That's a really good service. But mm -hmm. I would say, honestly, we might get a handful of people a year that use a virtual backdrop. And sometimes people need to just because of circumstances in life. So we're fine with it. Same. Perfect. Thank you for covering all possible scenarios. I love hearing about the virtual backgrounds, um, but I'll just remind everybody, make sure if you are going to use a Case Western one that you switch it if you have an <laughs> interview. I mean, I don't know if you- At another joking. medical school. <laughs> that you would hurt my feelings if you showed up with a Case Western background. <laughs> you might give, uh, you're giving your hand away. So, all right, now we're going to really get into the nitty gritty. So we're going to talk about the questions that uh, a lot of these came from uh, folks who attended our spring session about the, the, the grayer areas. So we'll get started. And um, can you share what's too personal to share? I tried to kind of hint around it when I did the mock interview about a stressful situation. I kind of talked about the spring, um, kind of mentioned depression in there. Um, to us, mental health is the same as physical health. You know, if, if you told us you had cancer and didn't tell us what you were doing to take care of yourself, we would be like, well, that, why aren't they taking care of their cancer? That would be our primary concern in reading your statement. So when you tell us that you are battling depression and you don't tell us what you're doing to take care of yourself, we're, we're more focused on you getting the help you need than you going to medical school, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, if you want to disclose uh, mental health challenges that you faced, tell us what you're, you're doing to kind of Take care of yourself. That's for us. Um, if you put it in your application materials, it's fair game to interviewers. And yes, we do train our interviewers not to um, ask certain questions, but they're human and sometimes they might want to know the answers to something. Yeah, agree. So you, we strike a balance between reflection and honesty and showing your real self versus this is a professional school application. So be mindful uh, when you're writing, what do you want us to get out of it? Why are you disclosing this to us? Does this help us get a better understanding of who you are? Or is this sort of unwillingly going on the train of the therapy essay where you've got a lot that you need to process and you're working through and instead it's coming out in your professional school application where maybe it shouldn't. So certainly getting people to read your essays and reacting to you is important in your understanding how they're being perceived. So again, 
we value reflection. We value who you are as a human. We value the challenges you've been through. They're all very important to Ms. Kimball's point. We want to know how you're adjudicating it. But sometimes we have absolutely seen people go on the other side where it was just way too personal for a professional school application. Great advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do have to mention that someone said they are a mega fan of Tums and All Access Podcasts, Dr. Meadows. So that's a shout out Yay! to you. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Keep watching, it's guys. It's an awesome Listening. podcast series. It is highly recommended. Okay, so um, what are some good questions to ask your interviewer? It depends on the interviewer. It depends on how things are going. I don't know that there's a one size fits all question. Questions that show actual curiosity and not just, I just read a list of questions that I should ask my interviewer and I'm gonna ask and I don't really care what the answer is because I just know I need to ask you some questions. So things you may wanna know, I understand that in the course of an interview, you may be nervous and not actually be able to think so, you know, with your, with your higher cognitive functions, I guess. But think about what you wanna know about the school as you're perusing the materials, which hopefully you do, Hopefully you don't show up at an interview without having read the materials. It's like showing up for a job interview without researching the company. Think about what are your questions? What jogs for you? You can ask people the same question and then tailor it to the interviewer, whether it's a student or a faculty, it's a physician or a researcher. If you run out of questions, most people like to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can always ask about why do you like this institution? What keeps you here? What drew you here? So sort of in that vein. I absolutely concur. I think um, part of the challenge that we face sometimes is that um, students feel like, or candidates feel like if they ask one person how they feel about the curriculum, for instance, that's going to be how everybody feels about the curriculum. So you might want to ask different or the same question to different people to get different points of view on something. Um, oftentimes our interviewees will want to know the name of the interviewer that will be interviewing them ahead of time. And I think this is I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but please don't feel like you have to interview your interviewer to show your interest, you know? Oh, I see that you're a urologist. What is that like? You know, I mean, I, I read the paper you wrote for urology today on X, Y, and Z. Don't, you don't do that. Like, don't do that. Don't need so, to do that, yeah. Yeah. And to Jen's point earlier, by the time you get to the medical school interview, I really feel that you, the applicant, are interviewing us as much yes. as we're interviewing you. So I know, listen, I was a med student long a million years ago, and I remember thinking, oh, I've got an interview, you love me. I gotta, you're interviewing us because you need to go to a school that's a good fit for you as well. So obviously you're not gonna be high-handed and imperious, but you're gonna ask questions that you really need to know the answers to in order for you to move forward with an open heart of where you may be going. And I think that reflects on what you value in a medical school um, and think about how you learn the best. You know, think about the classes that you took in school that you really thrived in and what helped you thrive in that environment in that classroom. Maybe it was a smaller class where it was more, you know, collaborative and team approach. Maybe it was a lecture hall that you could just kind of watch the, the lecture after hours and rewind and double time and stuff to learn. So reflect upon yourself and what you value and how you learn best and seek that out into medical school. Great advice. Thank you so much. I'm going to skip um, our fourth bullet and we'll go back to it. But in the same light, um, what are some inappropriate um, questions that the admissions team sometimes could ask or an interviewer could ask? And how can you pivot from that? That's a great question. And this is something that shows up a lot in residency interviews, maybe less in medical school, but asking anything about your gender, your race, ethnicity outside of what's relevant to the application. Are you pregnant? Do you want to have kids? Do you want to get married? Do you want to get engaged? Those are all actually legal questions. Our interviewers are trained to not ask those. And mind you, I have a pool of 75 interviewers. Does one go renegade every now and then? Sometimes, hardly ever happily, but anecdotally it's happened. So anything that makes you feel really uncomfortable that you know are sort of legally protected areas are not allowed to talk about are inappropriate. Interviewers are also not allowed to divulge anything in the letter of recommendation to you if you signed the privacy waiver. So that's something our interviewers are trained not to do as well. And if that does happen, tell the director of admissions or dean of admissions, whoever is the, the point person for your interview day, because we're mortified when those things happen um, and we want to nip it in the bud very quickly. 
we want to know. Yeah. So yeah. I know that there's a power differential that you may feel and maybe you're comfortable going through a pre-med advisor, but we really want to know. We are absolutely mortified. And I have removed interviewers from our process yeah. who just couldn't seem to get yeah. that message. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Get those rule breakers out. But yes, mm -hmm. it is it is actually illegal to ask those questions. So we want to make sure that uh, interviewees are empowered if they feel uncomfortable with the question, they don't need to answer it because they, they feel like they want to attend this school and they want to make sure um, that they look good. Um, so don't be pressured into that. So thank you. That's a wonderful. So, so Maria, let me qualify that too. There are ways to pivot when you're asked a question like that. For example, what are your plans for pregnancy? That happens a lot in residency. I've never let my personal life get in the way of my professional life. I have no, no concerns about balancing things. So think about, do you want to try and sidestep it? Do you want to confront the interviewer? Do you want to answer it? And I don't think these happen quite as often at the med school level as they do at the residency level, but there's still things to content, kind of think about and think, think about how you may want to respond if you're asked one of those. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that additional information. It's really important. So we'll go back to bullet number four about the why medicine question. So we do have in, in the Q&A section, a lot of folks saying, okay, what do I say? Because it could be because I had a relative who was ill or I was ill or I was inspired by this and they want to make sure it doesn't come off as cliche or that they're repeating what's on their application. We so Jen, are, Jen, Ms. Kimball did a masterful job. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that we had talked ahead of time about <laughs> the why medicine um, because sometimes we'll get those response or to be very fair with you, usually by the time the student has interviewed, because they've gone through several screens, we've kind of weeded out, for lack of a better term, the ones who tell us they want to be a doctor because they love science and love to help people, or they, they want to be the leader on the medical team or, or something like that. Those are very surface answers. That's what we would expect out of like a seventh grade career project that they're doing for us. And so the reason why we value medical exposure so much for you is not because we like to put a hurdle up and say, now you have to volunteer in a healthcare setting before you go to medical school. That's not the case at all. It's to challenge you to make sure you're going into the right health profession program for you, where your interests, where your values and your interests and your attributes align. And so coming up with sort of your own personal mission statement about why you want to be a physician is, is helpful. Um, like Dr. Meta said, you don't want to rehearse it so that in an interview when they say, why do you want to be a physician? We press play and you give us this response that you've canned and, and you say to all the medical schools. But truly, this is a time of reflection. Um, why do you want to be a doctor? And the answer that you give is going to be different than the answer that somebody else gives. And that's OK. Agree with all of those. Um, and even if you do have a cliched reason, if you will, for your, that piqued your initial curiosity in the medicine, you can talk about the experiences that you've had in a much more mature fashion that have helped you really understand that this is the right path for you. Mm -hmm. So maybe it did start with a family member who was ill or you had a teddy bear that you put a Band-Aid on their knee or what have you. But what mature, you know, adult, more adult level experiences have you had that have helped to underscore that this is the right path for you? And just as a, a, a second question to that, would you say that what you're really looking for um, is to make sure they're really passionate about what they're saying, not just, again, I, I was sick and I had a nice doctor and now I want to be a doctor, but really be, uh, commit to uh, this entire medical education journey plus the career that follows? I would say it's a combination of passion and pragmatism. Right, so we can all watch Grey's Anatomy and be inspired by the terrible medical thing. I mean, a lot of them are so fetchy and correct, I can't even watch it, but whatever. We can all watch Grey's Anatomy or watch a TV show and be inspired and impassioned by what we see, but have you pragmatically taken the time and the steps? Medicine is not for the faint of heart. It is a hard path, and people are impressed when you tell them that you are a future physician because they know the sacrifice you're going to make. So it's a combination of passion and then pragmatism of I've taken the time to explore and understand that this is a sacrifice I'm willing to make. And these are things that I'm willing to put myself through. 
when um, in my former life, I was the director of pre health advising at Georgia Tech and at Emory for a very long time. And I would help applicants write their personal statements. And I would tell them, if you could put your thumb over the word doctor and put in the word nurse, physician assistant, pharmacist, whatever, and your personal statement would still make sense for that other career path, you need to dig deeper. You need to reflect more. You need to uh, do informational interviews with physicians and stuff to kind of learn a little bit more about that, that uh, field that you're going into. I've never heard of that. Wow. That, that is a great, great tip. So thank you. Um, we're actually going to move into our Q and a section now from our, we, we have hundreds of uh, questions. So I'm trying to select the ones that are kind of asked more often. We talked about physical appearance. Um, there are a couple questions about Again, the, the things that are allowed to be asked and the things that are not allowed to be asked. What if someone asks what other schools you're applying at or you're considering? Is How to navigate that? Is that something that's allowed? We train our interviewers to not ask that because when you apply the whole ethos of the AMCAS application process and all of the CYMS tools is we're not allowed to know where else you're applying. So our interviewers are trained to not ask that because we think it violates the covenant. You might be asked that. You can think about how you would be comfortable. You can give a geographic region. You can name out schools specifically. You can say, I'm still waiting to see. It's it's kind of depends on how you are comfortable answering that. But really, we would hope you don't get that asked, asked that much, if at all. Bingo, yeah. And, and you could always just say, I'm applying to other schools similar in, you know, leadership or medical education or whatever as, XYZ school, but um, we also train our interviewers not to ask that question. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. So a lot of questions are coming in in regards to after the interview. What is something proactive you can do after the interview? Should you call and ask uh, for feedback? Should you send a thank you card or email? What are some things that would help applicants stand out? For us, we tell you on interview day that you're more than welcome to send thank yous. Um, you're more than welcome to send updates to your file. Um, you can send a letter of interest. And really, honestly, the only reason why we accept letters of interest is because back when I was an advisor, um, I got to learn a lot about the psyche of a pre-med student. And they're so used to being in control of the situation. And when you apply to medical school, you're kind of at the mercy of the medical schools, and that can provide a lot of anxiety in the application process. So I tell them, if you, if it makes you sleep easy at night to know you've done everything you can, you're more than welcome to write us a letter of interest. We put it in your file. It's no harm, no foul. Um, the thing that does move the needle, though, though, for us is if you're waitlisted and you send an update to your file, express interest in attending our school when we're starting to make those waitlist decisions. But we actually email all of our waitlist our candidates specific steps if this is still a school that they want to go into. But every every med school is different on what they accept. So really follow the tone and tenor of what the director or dean of admissions tells you. Agree, same thing. We don't accept any updates from applicants unless they've been invited to interview because we get too deluged by the unbelievable number of apps that we have. But once you're interviewed with us, you're welcome. We, we, we have an easy way to upload an update or a thank you in our portal, but there are some schools who don't want to hear from you at all. And so if they say, we don't want anything from you ever at all, adhere to what they said, as Ms. Kimball said. And for us too, it gets help. It's helpful for us to know who's actually continues to be interested when we start to hit the wait list. And reading and listening to what the school is saying. I'm sure that, that, that matters as well. Mm -hmm. We have had this question, at least 20 people have asked this question in different ways. The, the dreaded, what is your weakness slash biggest shortcomings question. Area of growth, those kind of questions. Correct. How, how if that comes up, how uh, should, <clears throat> excuse me, an interviewee uh, tackle that one? It's, so that's the reason why I kind of gave the, I'm a perfectionist answer because Nobody wants to admit that they have a weakness, but everybody does. Um, and if you don't have a weakness, that means you're not reflecting on yourself because we want to be lifelong learners and constantly grow and develop our, our skills. Uh, so it, 
don't try to make your negative into a positive. Um, you know, sometimes students will kind of force it like, you know, my weakness is I'm a perfectionist and I think that's going to make me a great doctor because I, you know, work hard to make things perfect. And it's like, okay, that's forced. Um, but it's fine to say, you know, this is an area of growth for me. You know, I, um, you know, I sometimes will take on too much because I'm excited about a project and sometimes I'll start to feel overwhelmed, but I really, um, in the last, you know, the last two semesters really focused in on that and have been changing it by being more, um, you know, selective about what I choose to be involved with or something like that. So you told me that you tend to bite off more than you can chew, but you've noticed that this is a problem for you and you've been working on ways to minimize that behavior. So exactly as Ms. Kimball said, we're looking for growth mindset. We're yep. looking for exactly. the ability to see where you need to, the day we stop evolving is a sad day indeed, right? We're all growing always. So can you be reflective about where your growth area is and how are you going to address that as time goes by? You tackled that perfectly. That's wonderful because that I, I think that is probably the most common question we're getting today repeatedly. I mean, it's a terrible question. <laughs> it is. It's like, do I reveal too much? And then will they think this? Do I do a humble brag? Which is the whole perfectionist thing, right? That's the humble brag. Exactly. So if 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 you can think about what why you're being asked that question, I think it helps you to understand how you may want to answer it. So for us again, and for Ms. Kimball and for most other schools. We need resiliency in medicine. Again, Absolutely. medicine's hard and we are always evolving and growing. We're lifelong learners. So if you can think about what the reason for the question is, it'll frequently help you answer it. That's great. Um, we do have some questions. The, the first part of the question is, do you anticipate that the virtual interview space is gonna continue or do you feel like it eventually go back to going at the, to the institutions or hybrid, um, but where do you see the trend going? That's a great question. I'm actually the chair of the committee on admissions. And so we're having a lot of conversation about this right now. We're doing some research with AAMC to see if we can find any outcomes from what virtual and what may have transpired with virtual interviews versus live interviews. My strong COA, the committee on admissions, we are strongly recommending that schools consider with virtual, continue with virtual interviews if it works for their process. That said, there are some schools who've already gone live this year. I think the lion's share of school, Ms. Kimball asked you, the lion's share of schools will probably stay virtual in perpetuity, but some will probably continue to go back live. We, in our last uh, couple of classes that were all virtual, have not noticed any difference in the cohort of students who've matriculated. So it would be different if it was a wild extreme, we might go, you yeah, know, I probably need to do something back in person, but we, we haven't, um, so. Same, and, and again, to get back to a point that Ms. Kimball made earlier, equity, it's really expensive to travel right now. I mean, any air ticket right now is double almost the cost that it was three years ago. So it's just so expensive and unwieldy and flights are getting canceled. And it just, it's hard to think about going back and subjecting applicants to that whole live travel thing again. Now, if you're a school that has a very regional pool, maybe you draw your state school, you only draw on like 120 mile radius, that's a different conversation than a school like Vanderbilt or Case Western that has a very large national pool. As a ex-financial aid employee <laughs> um, for 10 years, I really appreciate that because um, it, is, it is highly, highly expensive to travel and the other things that go with it from lodging to food to possibly something to wear, et cetera. So thank you, that's great. Um, are schools allowed to record interviews? In the state of Tennessee, we're not allowed to. It's, it's their state law. You, I don't know, but it's, I've never heard of a school recording an interview without letting an applicant know that was happening. So, but it, you would be governed by whatever your state laws are. Ohio is a, I forget what it's called, where one party is allowed to record without the consent of the other. I can't imagine why you would do it. But again, it's going to boil down to state laws in the end. Now, which can be difficult if you're doing in virtual interviews, where do the state laws apply? So it's a whole kettle of fish. That is true. Um, so what would you do if they do ask if, uh, they can record it and you would prefer they not. 
think about why you would prefer they not. I mean, sometimes I wonder if I'm being recorded. So maybe it's happening, I don't know. If a school asks if you can, they can record the interview you are certainly within your rights to ask what the reason for that might be. And if it's something that's logical, I probably would say yes, unless you're super uncomfortable with it. And if it's kind of like, uh, we're just going to have it just in case, you're certainly welcome to question it further. I've never heard of any school doing that, though. Did yeah, I've been trying call? to think. Have you experienced that? Uh, they did not mention that. They just mentioned it loosely um, about recording. But um, I think that that's a, in, in the era of virtual interviews, we want to make sure that everybody knows that they have rights in regards to these things and that they uh, the schools and the interviewers have to adhere to uh, many rules in regards to that. So how would you, um, how should applicants talk about culture, ask about culture at the institution since now they're not being able to be there physically? Would that be a good question to ask uh, your interviewer? I think so. And I think once again, that's going to be the question that you're going to want to ask a bunch of different people because everybody kind of has a different viewpoint of it. Um, but sometimes asking about the culture tends to be a little bit vague. Like, what do you mean about the culture? Like, you know, so if there's something specific you want to get at about the culture, really frame it in that context. Because if I, if you ask me about the culture of Vanderbilt, if my culture in uh, Dr. Meta's culture, it's probably gonna be very similar. You know, we, we have students that you know, are very engaged in the curriculum and, you know, are very friendly and, and stuff like that. So I can't think of a single medical school that wouldn't say that about the culture of their school. So be very specific about what you want to get out of that when you ask that question. Agreed. And that said, we are very cognizant of the fact that it's important to get a feel for culture for mm -hmm. somebody who's debating where to go to medical school. So most of us have other information sessions. We have other yes. opportunities to meet with students. We have a mock Inquiry group IQ is sort of the main component of our learning in the first two years. We have you do IQ opportunities where students can log in with Zoom and do a case. So take advantage of all of these other opportunities that schools give you to get more insight into the culture and the style. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I'm knocking on wood here, barring any pandemic, um, we're planning on doing second look weekend in person this spring. And pretty much every school has a revisit weekend or second look weekend where you can come to campus, um, sit in on classes, meet your, you know, your cohort that has also been admitted there, look for places to live, um, all that kind of stuff. So take advantage of those opportunities too once you're admitted. Love that. In regards to uh, reapplicants, are there and, and I know you can only speak for your institution, um, are their previous application, is it considered with their new application or is it just the new application for the current cycle? For us, it's the, just the new com our application. We don't look at the previous application. Same, and it is very dependent school to school. My admissions committee likes the reapplicant. We think that we know that applying to medical school is hideous. And if you're willing to do it again, you must be pretty committed. We do look for changes, however, that we can ascertain from that app. I think it's there's always two schools of thought. Do I say that I'm a reapplicant? Do I not say that I'm a reapplicant? My school of thought is I'd like to know what's different for you now than the prior application cycle. Are you reflective about where you are today versus where you were before? And on the AMCAS, we'll see that you are a reapplicant. Mm -hmm. We'll see what year you applied previously. Um, and we don't say, oh gosh, they applied in 2020, didn't get in. So ew, we don't want them now. You know, there's something obviously wrong with them. It's not the case at all. There are a lot of highly qualified pre-med students that unfortunately won't get into medical school first time they apply, not necessarily because of them, just because there are so many people who want to get into this career industry. So um, sometimes you have to work on areas and reapply. So if this is really the, the fire in the belly, the passion for a career in medicine, don't give up if you don't get in the first time. Reflect upon what you need to improve upon, do that and then apply. None of us are closing down shop next year. We're gonna be here, you know, 50 years from now, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, you know, apply when you are at the strongest that you can be. Hopefully not on the Zoom 50 years from now. I will yeah. likely not be working in 50 <laughs> years. I just want to tell you that. 
<laughs> well, I'm very young. I'm only like 18. So I, I'm, I'm okay with it. So Longer for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, regarding the application again, some of the questions asked during interviews mirror something that was asked for the personal statement or the application. How can they um, share that information again? Should they share that information again if that's kind of the only answer that they have? for that question? Or should they really try to, especially on the spot, think of something that uh, will give another viewpoint? Well, certainly you're gonna summarize, you're not gonna read your whole essay back to the interviewer. So you can contextualize it a little bit more based on how that question was posed to you. There's probably gonna be some overlap because the AMCAS and secondary applications are so extensive with so much information that you don't need to feel that everything you talk about is novel. We read about it, you will talk about it, but the way you talk about it is gonna be different than the way you wrote about it, just even by virtue of those two media. So if you have the ability and the bandwidth and you think, I think that I would like to talk about this essay that I wrote about, but I feel like I could talk about this instead, go for it. But this is not, hopefully interviews are not constructed to like make you crazy and completely stress you out. They're actually a give and take of information. So if, if you can kind of keep that in mind, again, I always get back to think about why they're asking me this. Sometimes it's an unskilled interviewer. We are interviewers are trained. We have standardized interview questions that everybody asks. So hopefully ours are not going renegade and asking things that aren't so relevant. But again, the media are very different, writing versus spoken. So if that's the answer that fits, speak it. Wonderful. Um, we're gonna do one last question, but it does have two parts. And this is a question about non-traditional applicants. The first question that was asked is, um, do you ask non-traditional applicants different questions than traditional applicants? And, and some ask in regards to age or other things. So non-traditional has not been specified as to what that means to each applicant or institution. Um, for us, we might just, so I'm gonna answer that based on the assumption that non-traditional means somebody who might be a career changer um, with that. So. Um, for us, we might kind of want to know a little bit more about your career journey, you know, oh, I see in here that you uh, taught seventh grade social studies, uh, you know, what, what was that pivot like from, you know, being a teacher to then going back to a post back program and taking pre-med, you know, courses and, and stuff. So we might kind of want to know more about that issue. Um, like Dr. Mehta said, we're not going to say, wow you're going to medical school at 28, you're super old. Like we're not gonna ask those kind of questions or anything like that. I think the only different question we probably ask is just about your career trajectory. Same for us, as I said, we have a standardized interview uh, format. We do have one question where you're allowed to deviate and ask things that are more, um, say even more targeted to that application. But again, interviewers are trained to not do this. We love non-trads by the way. Oh, we yeah. love the rich life experience, all of us. So if you're a non-trad, that's a badge of honor, not a badge of shame. But we want to understand how your trajectory makes sense. Are you just, are you, was it that you hated your last job and you wanted to find something else to do? Yep. Or is it that you're actually wanting to move forward this way in a really intentional way? Mm -hmm. Especially like Dr. Meta said, if you are coming from another health profession, applying to an MD program, really have a strong answer for that. Um, we interviewed folks who have changed, transitioned from one career in health industry to another. And their reason why is, is not necessarily um, positive about being an MD, it's more negative about being this other health profession, if that makes sense, so. Fantastic. You actually answered the second question already in your answers, so wonderful. So we do have two minutes left. We wanna make sure that folks, um, we adhere to the schedule, especially yours, because we cannot thank you enough for being a part of this. The information that you have shared with us is completely invaluable. Um, and I already see folks asking and saying thank you. Uh, some asking how they can contact you again. Um, there's folks asking for your tip sheet, uh, Mrs. Kimball, in regards to interviewing um, and what they should prepare. So um, that might be something you wanna consider sharing with folks. Uh, um, um, get invited to interview at Vanderbilt and it's all yours, my friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, so Vanderbilt specifically, great. Yes. It is, uh, it's very Vanderbilt specific, so. Perfect, uh, we understand. Um, any last pieces of supportive advice for our future uh, 
medical applicants? I think for me, it's know yourself, know your application very well, know your why, um, but also be you, be yourself. Um, people often ask me, what kind of students do you accept at Vanderbilt? And I'm like, I don't know, like we accept all sorts of people, you know, so I can't give you this cookie cut answer that, oh, they had 500 hours of medical exposure and they did three semesters of community service at the Ronald McDonald House. Like our students are so different and that's what makes our class strong. Um, you know how like all your life people told you to be well-rounded? For medicine, we want you to be pointy at Vanderbilt. And so those points kind of come together to make a well-rounded class. Um, so be your authentic self in your interview. Um, obviously with the tips and training that we've provided you over the last hour to polish off that application. Um, but like I said, just, just have fun. Remember that we're not asking you to interview so we can grill you. Yeah, we might want to know about that C in organic chemistry, but it's not to you know, interrogate you about it. We just kind of want to know what happened in organic chemistry spring every junior year because everything else is phenomenal with your application. So know yourself and be confident going into the interview. Agreed. We don't want a class full of pre-med bots who all look the same, think the same, and have done the same thing. That said, we know their experiences that most applicants need to have had to ensure that this is the right path. There are so many niches that need to be filled in medicine that if we accept only the homogeneous one size fits all, we're gonna do a disservice to our future patient population. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Mehta. <clears throat> Mrs. Kimball, I apologize. Um, and a reminder to everyone who's watching, we have, uh, you want to be pointy if you want to attend Vanderbilt. <laughs> And don't and don't be a bot if you are interested in Case Western. So thank you again. This was fantastic. And we really appreciate not only your time, but your insight. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. You, you got this. Good luck.